Hallelujah. Come on, somebody turn to your neighbor and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we'll be glad in it. Come on, find a better neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I'll be glad in it. All right, I know we have a choir up here, but I need us to make a big choir in the sanctuary and at home today, okay? So you're gonna sing after me. Everybody lift your voice and say, oh, oh, oh. and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Say, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad Come on, you got your part, say, oh. Hallelujah. We bless your name. Hallelujah. We praise your name. We praise your name. Hallelujah. 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 We praise your name. Hall
thank you for this day that we've never seen. Thank you for new mercies, for new grace. God, for new favor this morning. God, you are an awesome God. You are an omnipotent God. God, you already knew what was going to happen today before it ever happened. So within all of the chaos, within all the confusion, within all of the adjustments, God, you're still here. You still met us here this morning. You're still here with us in the sanctuary, and God, you're at home even now. So God, we thank you for your presence that has already met us here in this place. God, we thank you for a word that's going to penetrate every heart this morning. God, we thank you for a safe space to worship you, to lean on you. So God, thank you again for having your way in this place, Lord. And we will forever give you all praise, all glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord.
Come on, EBC, let's give God praise and give God glory. Come on, you can do better than that. This is the day that the Lord has made, and you and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. How many can testify that he is all of that and much, much, much more in your life? He's your light. He's your salvation. He's your rock. He's your redeemer. He's your bridge over troubled water. He's your lily in a valley. He's your bright and morning star. He's a seek your will in the center of a will. Come on and give God praise and give God glory. He's your way maker. He's your miracle maker. Come on and give God praise even right now. He's your all in all. He's your midnight rider and your four day traveler. Come on and give God praise. Give God glory from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. His name is worthy to be praised. Come on, put those blessed hands together and give God praise in this place. And you who join us, even in the virtual space, how we honor God for your presence on today as we share in this hybrid experience of worship, as we come together in this physical place, and as you join us even in the virtual space, we know that there is just as much God in the space that you are in even right now virtually as he is even in this said place. Scripture declares that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, implying that God cannot be confined to one geographical location. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Come on and give God praise even right now. Give God glory even right now. Bless his name even right now. Oh, there's a sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it is the presence of the Lord, and we bless his name even on this day. And you may claim your seats if you're able to do so even right now. And what an amazing day it has been. What an eventful day it has been in the life of our church here at EBC. Perhaps you have heard, unfortunately, our Atlanta location is without power at this moment because the car at about four or five o'clock this morning ended up hitting a power pole and knocked all of the power off within that general vicinity of EBC off of Cascade Road. And so I want to just applaud and appreciate our staff and our leaders uh, who made an adaptive move, who made an adaptive move. I'm reading this amazing book by Edgar Schein, and he talks about one of the qualities of a leader is, the, qual is the, the leader's ability to make an adaptive move because, listen, issues are going to happen. Disruptions are going to happen. Circumstances is going to happen. Life is going to happen. And you got to know how to make an adaptive move, how to pivot, how to change, and how to make adjustments. And so we gather together in a quick huddle, and in less than about a few minutes, we decided to come from the Atlanta location to the Douglasville location and was able to have our 930 service online and as well as now our 1045 service is taking place and 12 o'clock, you're gonna have the opportunity to experience worship as well in our virtual community. And again, I'm just so appreciative for the amazing staff of men and women that we have that has been working around this particular issue. And the reality is it was outside of our control, but we was able to make a move and I'm excited about what God is doing. Come on and give God praise again in this moment, in this moment. And so even at this time, beloved of God, we're preparing to even worship God by way of giving. What a joy it is to give, what an honor it is to give, what a blessing it is to give. Come on, you can show more enthusiasm than that. What a joy it is to give. And scripture declares that God loves a cheerful giver, those who give with a sense of excitement and those who give with a sense of glee and joy. And you and I should give with that type of disposition because God has blessed us with the capacity. God has blessed us with the ability whereby we're able to give. Scripture declares that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and the world and all they that dwell therein. Even scripture says that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. And so we recognize that as we give today, we are giving out of what God has given unto us. God has blessed us with jobs. God has blessed us with sources of income. God has blessed us with means whereby we're able to give. And it is out of the portion of what God has given, un given unto us that we give even today. And we believe, believe in the biblical principle and practice of tithing as is seen in Scripture. 
that we're to give unto God, that we're to consecrate unto God, that we're to sanctify unto God a tenth part of our income and of our increase as we give it unto God and to the work of God. As Malachi says, so that there will be provision in this, the Lord's storehouse. And so as we give today, we give claiming the promise of Scripture that God will open up the windows of heaven and he will pour us out blessings to the degree that you and I will not even be able to receive them all. And how many can testify that you cannot beat God in giving no matter how hard you try? And so we give as an act of worship. We give as an act of faith. We give as an act of Christian stewardship. We give today as an act of obedience. And so, beloved of God, you know that there is a myriad of ways whereby you're able to give. And we ask that you would identify a platform that is of your preference. And as you give, it's a very safe and secure way to do so. We pray and trust that many of you are availing yourselves to the digital platform as you can set up your account by way of our church accounting system. And you can see to it that you can give in a reoccurring and systematic way. And so now let's bow in a word of prayer as we'll ask the Lord's blessings upon our gifts. Father, how we honor you, how we thank you, and how we praise you for the privilege that is ours as we come now to give. We ask, O oh God, that you would bless each and every seed that is about to be sown. We pray, God, that you would bless each and every sower. Father, we pray that even as we give today, that you would multiply our gifts and sanctify them, that they might be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom and the advancing of your cause. We thank you, God, that you will see to it that grace will always abound towards us to the degree that we will always have sufficiency towards every kingdom endeavor that you've entrusted to our hands and hearts to fulfill. And so, Father, we thank you now that we're walking in favor. We're walking in abundance. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. We pray in, and all those that agree with this prayer in one united voice said, Amen. Also, EBC, let me again applaud you. As many of you heard, of course, we had an op opportunity to support our ministry as it relates to Operation Uplift. And uh, a few Sundays ago, we raised close to about $20,000 that would go to the students at Clark Atlanta University, many of which were displaced as a result of the flood. So, EBC, I just wanted to thank you for that. At this time as well, we're preparing now to share in the Lord's Supper, which is a time wherein we consecrate ourselves and focus upon this moment that reminds us of the sacrifice of Christ, how Jesus willingly died in our stead for our sins, that we might become the righteous recipients of salvation. And so you even now, I would ask in the virtual community that you would make ready to share in this time of observation, this time of worship by going and grabbing a piece of bread or a cracker and some sort of substitute thereof, and even juice as we will prepare for this time of worship via the Lord's Supper. Again, the Lord's Supper is designed to be a time wherein we pause to repent of our sins, recognizing that all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. We all have sinned in some word, act, or deed. And so scripture declares that as we confess our sins, that he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Also during communion, communion it is a time wherein we rejoice over our salvation. That there is no greater cause of rejoicing than the fact that we are saved, that we are born again, that our names have been written in the Lamb Book of Life. It is also a time wherein we come to a point in place that we remember our Savior. We pause to think about the death, the atoning death of Jesus Christ, who again became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in and through his death. And that last of all, communion is a time wherein we go and retell the story. We go share with men and women, boys and girls, how Jesus can indeed save. From the uttermost to the guttermost, as one would say, he can save. And so with that having been said, our praise team is going to prepare our hearts with this brief selection as you would even prepare yourself for this time in sharing in the Lord's Supper. Just who I am.
Jesus and his disciples had gathered in the upper room wherein he institutionalized what we celebrate and commemorate this day being that of the Lord's Supper. He took the unleavened bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he passed it among his disciples. And that bread in which they held within their hands represented his body that would soon be a fit to the cross for their sins and the sins of the world. And so in the spirit of that day, we share now in the Lord's Supper. And in doing so, I would ask that you would repeat after me as I shall eat this broken wafer. I am reminded of the body of Jesus Christ that was crucified for my sins. Let us eat it and be thankful. As well on that day, he not only shared with them the unleavened bread, but also the fruit of the vine was poured into a cup. The content within that cup was crimson in color, denoting his blood. Scripture emphatically declares that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of our sins. And so again, in the spirit of that day, would you repeat after me as I should drink the fruit of the vine? I am reminded of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for my sins. Let us drink it and be thankful. The Bible declares that after they had shared in the Lord's Supper, they departed from that place rejoicing and singing a hymn. And I believe even right now is a good place for us to rejoice. Even right now is a good place for us to give God praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I am, I am redeemed. To God be all praise and to God be all of the glory. You may claim your seats in the presence of our God, and I'm excited to share with you today's message as we are dealing again with our mission statement, and we're talking about the cruciality of our mission statement, the cruciality of our mission statement. Last week, of course, we attempted to give a deeper, def deeper interpretation and understanding of our mission statement as we went through the process of dissecting each and every word and each and every phrase to explain the intent behind such so that you and I in all of our getting can at least get an understanding. And prayerfully today, you and I would understand the cruciality of our mission statement. With that having been said, would you bow with me in a word of prayer? God, how we honor you and how we thank you and how we bless you for the privilege that is ours to gather in this sacred space and place. We pray, God, that even as we now position and posture ourselves to hear your word, we pray that you would speak Enable us to hear what indeed your spirit is saying to the church. And may we have a heart of compliance. May we respond with obedience. As we see to not just hear, but most importantly, do your word. So Holy Spirit, you are indeed the perfect teacher. Teach us and lead us and guide us into all spiritual truth is our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray it. And all those that agree with this prayer in one united voice said, Amen. Again, ABC, just a few weeks ago, we went through the process of unveiling our mission statement, and hopefully by now you have 
that mission statement committed committed to both head and heart committed to both head and heart on the count of three I'm going to ask of you that you would cite, recite with me the mission statement one two three inciting one another to multiply the breakthrough love of God. Can we say with greater excitement and enthusiasm? One, two, three. Inciting one another to multiply the breakthrough love of God. This statement is our mission statement. Inciting one another to multiply the breakthrough love of God. It is crucial because it embodies the transformative power of God's breakthrough love. Again, the very opening word, inciting one another, denotes that it is an active process. Actively, we're seeking to engage, we're seeking to motivate, we're seeking to stimulate each other, to share and to show, better yet, to spread God's breakthrough love. And we're not just seeking to incite, but also to multiply. Multiplying God's love reflects a commitment of sharing it abundantly and continuously. And so this mission compels us to break through barriers. This mission at its heart deals with the transformation of lives. This mission deals with the reality of how healing and restoration can take place and how God in and through his immeasurable love, his unconditional love, his sacrificial love, has extended his love towards us. And in doing so, he offers unto us and mandates of us the responsibility to extend and to express that same love even to others. And so today I want to hopefully explain the cruciality of our mission statement in that as believers, we are called to extend, we are called to express our love towards God and not just our love towards God, but furthermore, love towards fellow mankind. Because at the core, at the center of our mission statement, I submit and suggest to you lies what is known as the great commandment. It is absolutely impossible for us to fulfill the mission statement without understanding the commandment that Jesus has given to us, which is an imperative. And so as we will look at this great commandment, we will look at the great commandment along two interesting perspectives. We will look at it along the vertical perspective, which deals with the vertical axis, and then we'll also look at it from the horizontal, which deals with the horizontal axis, to which you and I would then begin, begin to see the breakthrough love of God even the more. Consider, if you would, first of all, the vertical axis of this whole aspect of known, known as the great commandment. Because again, at the core of the great commandment is the love of God. Upon asked by Jesus by way of a lawyer, what is the greatest of all the commandments? Jesus comes to a point in place of con giving a concise and distilled expression of the greatest among them. It is there in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, down to verse number 39, wherein Jesus says, here it is. Love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. What is it again? To love God how, church? With all of your what? Heart. With all of your what? Soul. With all of your what? Mind. And Jesus underscores it by saying, and this is the first and greatest commandment. In other words, our love for God must be a priority, must be the pursuit of our hearts. And notice what he says, we're to love him with the totality of our humanity. By way of an imperative, Jesus says that this is not a mere spiritual suggestion. This is not a religious recommendation, but rather this is an injunction. This is an imperative to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Which helps us to see, A, the motivating factor. The motivating factor is God's love for humanity. In other words, we are motivated by the indescribable, incredible love of God that he has shown towards humanity. Matter of fact, throughout history, God 
it's constantly pursuing us with love. John 3, 16, you know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And God pursued us with this love, don't miss it, church, despite our sins and our shortcomings. He pursued us with this love in spite of our faults, failures, and fumbles. So much so that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross in order to restore us, to redeem us, to save us. And as a result of such, this constitutes the motivating factor of God's love towards humanity. But coupled with the motivating factor, we also have what could be defined as the reciprocal love. Not only do we see God's love for humanity, but this love should be reciprocated with humanity's love back to God. Because as a recipient of God's abundant, amazing love, we are called, here it is, to be recipients, not just recipients, but also to come to a point in place that we reciprocate that love back to God. We receive it and we reciprocate it. In other words, we give back unto God our expression of love, our expression of gratitude, our expression, here it is, of glory back unto him. The point is simply this, brothers and sisters, that as a result of God's love towards us, it ought to cause us to reciprocate worship to God. In other words, in that God says, I'm expecting you to love me with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, based upon the fact that I love you unconditionally. And I've loved you, here it is, before you even started loving me. And as a result of my love towards you, you not only receive my love, but you reciprocate my love. And you reciprocate my love, here it is, by giving me glory. By expressing your love back towards me and the expression of love back towards God and the giving of glory unto God can be defined as worship to God. Thus, God becomes the object of our affection, the object of our attention, the object of our allegiance. In other words, God, I prioritize you above everything and anyone because you are the one who loved me first. And because you are the lover of my soul, I give love back to you. And church, this is known as the vertical. Let the church say vertical. The vertical axis of love. But we not only see this aspect as it relates to the vertical axis of love, but coupled with that, we also see the horizontal axis of love. You ask the question, how do we see the horizontal axis of love? Because again, Jesus says in Matthew 22, verse 37 down to verse 38, love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. But the second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Loving the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, with all of thy mind. That's the vertical. But loving thy neighbor as thyself is the horizontal. Because what authenticates your vertical is your horizontal. If you really love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, you can't have hatred and revenge and bitterness and resentfulness in your heart because if I love him with all of my heart, it takes out the bitterness, the hatred, the anger. And so Jesus, in essence, tells us that the vertical deals with your love towards me and the horizontal deals with your love towards one another. And so this second axis of the great commandment focuses on our love that is extended and experienced by others. 
And not just others, but also, here it is, by a loved, deprived world. In other words, our love for God shall overflow into love for fellow believers. Hold on, stop. And not just fellow believers, but also those who are unbelievers. Because how else would they come to discover the breakthrough love of God if the believers who have become recipients of God's love doesn't also become the ones who are the conveyors of God's love. And as a result of such, this love that is to be conveyed in this love-deprived world comes from one unique body. And you know what body God is expecting this love to emanate from? The body of Christ. And so the church has been called to this sacred responsibility of being the conveyors of God's breakthrough love in a broken world. And not just a broken world, but a world that is deprived of love. And so notice again that the Bible is clear that one of the priorities of the Lord's church is to be an institution and an organism that extends and express love through our interaction, through our support, through our care for one another. And it ought to emanate from the church. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the church has more often been a bad representative of God's love. Bite biting, the tendency of saying that certain people can receive love while others cannot, because here it is, they're not a part of our preferred preference. And then we end up going through life not extending love because the church has become so skilled at sin keeping. We walk around with our scorecards and we look at everybody's sins and everybody's shortcomings and we then determine whether or not they are a candidate of God's love. Isn't that odd? That with all of your trifling ways, all of your sinful ways, God, you say have loved you, but then you want to withhold his love from others. So here's my argument. Be careful of asking for what you can't administer. In other words, you're asking for love, but you can't administer love. And your love that is administered must be the same type of love that even God administered to you, unconditional. I'm not waiting until you get your act together. I'm not waiting until you reach my moral ethical standard of how life ought be for you. No, even with all of your jacked up ways, I still love you. The same way God loved us, he loves the sinner and not the sin. What if the church really began to live out its call to be a love ambassador and a love agent in a love-deprived world? Matter of fact, Scripture says that charity ought to happen first in the house of God. It ought to start in the house of God and not stop in the house of God because there are some folks who honestly think that the only ones you ought to love are folks in the church. No, you got to learn how to let the love of God ooze out of the church and begin to intersect and connect with people who are still going through life and still going through the difficulties of life. Our love cannot just be confined to just us. Citing one another to multiply the breakthrough love of God. But here it is. If his love has not broken through in you, it's hard for that love to break through 
to touch someone else. The church, body of Christ, has been entrusted with this responsibility of being the conveyors of love. Notice in the context, the context, in a love-deprived world. I think you would agree with, agree with me that we live in a world that is starving for genuine love. Starving for compassion. Starving for acceptance. As followers of Christ, we've been called to be light in the midst of darkness, salt in the midst of decay, and love in the midst of hatred. Someone had it right. You put it to lyrics. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Little young thunder too young for that. Little young, little young thunder too young for that. He just uncrossed his 20s. He don't know about that just yet. If I had some old school musicians, they'll start. Our world is deprived of love. Because we want to regulate who deserves love. We want to come up with conditions who qualifies for love. And, 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 and if you're still wrestling with sin, wrestling with your habits and your hang-ups, I don't quite know if we can love you. And that's part of the reason, listen to this, because the very institution that is supposed to be the conveyors of love, unfortunately has become the conveyors, conveyors of everything else but love has caused people in a world deprived church, in a world in a love deprived community to say I want nothing to do with the world with the church can I tell you why because the church is guilty of false advertisement may, may I prove it we just took communion and we talk about how communion reminds us of how Jesus can forgive us, how Jesus has accepted us, how Jesus can transform us and take us from our worst state and transform our lives and bring us to a better place. And yet and still, we don't quite think he can do that for others. And when folks outside of the church see the hypocrisy in the church, and they end up feeling I can get more love in my gang than I can in your church. Why do I want to have anything to do with your church? And so notice again, I'm done, that in this great commandment, Jesus, who is the greatest teacher of all, in essence, gives this imperative what's the imperative love the Lord thy God with all of your heart in other words your love for him ought to have passion with all of your soul it ought to have a pursuit of purpose and with all of your mind your love ought to be conveyed not just with emotions but with intellect You ought to be intellectual astute in articulating why you love God and not just base your love on just some fluttering emotions. Can I tell you why? Because emotions fluctuate. 
But when you know what you know, and you know that you know what you know, whatever happens doesn't change what you know. I know God is good. I know God is a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. I know he's light in darkness. So I don't care what happens in my life. I know who God is. And I still, I still give him glory. I still give him honor. Even if I lose my job, I still bless your name. Even if he walk out, I still give you glory. Even if my body gets plagued with cancer, I still bless your name. Because I know you're still Jehovah Rapha. I know you're still Jehovah Jireh. I know you're still Jehovah Nisi. I know you're still my shepherd. I know who you are and I worship. But then Jesus says, don't just love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. That's the first and the greatest. But right under that, the second is to love thy neighbor as thyself. Ooh, for free, for free. And Jesus says, and this is what authenticates your discipleship. It's not how perfect your church attendance is. It's not how many events and programs you participate in the church. It's, it's not how much money you've given in tithes and offerings that authenticates your discipleship. He says all of that is good, great, and wonderful, but what really gives evidence that you're my disciple? By this shall all men know that you're my disciple. You belong to me because you love one another. You love who? Yellow. Brown. Black. White. They're all precious in his sight. I love who? Those who are straight. Those who are not. I love everybody. Not long ago, I, I was approached with a concern about someone who is wrestling with their sexual identity. And the question was, can we let them in our Bible study? And can they be in our crowd? And they wanted to put them out. I said, well, isn't that crazy? The very God that you claim can change lives. And the very word that you declare can make a difference. You're going to put them out of the place that could change them. And now if we're going to use sin as a gauge of who can study the Bible, you better be the first one to put yours down. Because all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. By this shall all men know that you're my disciple if you love one another. I can love the sinner and not condone the sin. And, 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 and watch what happens when you take the vertical axis. Love the Lord thy God, how church? With all thy heart, how? With all thy soul, and how? With all of thy and then the second says what? And what axis is that? Do you see what it makes? That at the heart of God's unconditional love is the cross. Because the cross is a message of how God loved us. That he loved us so much so that he came down from glory all the way down to earth in the form of flesh wrapped up in a manger wrapped up in swallowing clothes laid in a manger but then he also extended his love so 
that it does not matter how far you've gone. My love can reach you. It doesn't matter how far you're going down. My love can reach you because at the heart of the cross is a message of love. So as a church, our mission is critical. Why is it critical? It's critical because we live in a love-deprived world. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to prioritize, to pursue, to practice your love. Not just in the vertical, but help us now to intersect it with the horizontal. That we not just become recipients of your love, but we also begin to reciprocate your love. Help us to love one another. that our Christian witness will be authenticated by our practice of love towards one another. Now, Father, I pray that some man, some woman, some boy, some girl who are, is hearing this message will embrace your breakthrough love even now that can break through every habit, every hang-up, that can break through their history and all the hurts of their lives, may they experience your breakthrough love today. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on and give God praise and glory in this place. Uh, come on, you can do better than that. Let's all rest upon our feet, everyone, everywhere. Even right now, perhaps you're sensing in your soul, in your spirit, in your inner man, that God is speaking to you. And in doing so, you really sense the voice of God saying that this is your day. Your day to surrender your life to me. Your day to say yes. Your day to experience my breakthrough love that can break through every habit, can break through every single hurt and all of the hangups in your life if you would only but receive it today. You who are watching online as well, even right now appearing on your device, is an opportunity and an invitation for you to respond. And I pray that you will respond in the affirmative today. Say yes to the Lord. You are just one yes away from a breakthrough, one yes away from transformation, one yes away from experiencing God's breakthrough love. You who join us even on campus today, and you sense that God is speaking to you, I pray that you would not miss this moment. Scripture says, says, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Would you also respond in the affirmative? Our praise team is coming to lead us in this final selection. Whoever you are, wherever you are, respond. Say yes to the Lord. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much that he would not allow you to remain that way. He'll change you for the better. Would you come even right now? My man. There's no shadow you won't hide up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. Oh, there's no wall you won't kick down. Love you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow. No shadow you won't light up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whoever you are, wherever you are, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. And whatever you do, don't miss this moment. Trust God in this moment. And perhaps you're sitting there saying, I'm still not sure. And if you're waiting to have everything figured out, if you're waiting to make sense of everything, you'll never make a move. There's moments that you just got to say, God, without my knowing all the details, I'm going to walk by faith and trust you in this moment. Whoever you are, would you come? You watching again online, this is your opportunity. Respond, don't miss this. Let God do his perfect work in your life. One last time, praise him. We would trust God at this moment. Let's go, let's go. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. There's no shadow, you won't Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No wall you won't kick down. Hallelujah. No you won't tear down to me. Hallelujah. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Now you won't tear down. Coming after me. Can we give God praise and glory even right now? Oh, come on. You can do better than that. 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 Let's give God praise for our dear brother who boldly and in confidence walked even on today. And one of our skilled hands here at EBC who has joined our church and has been a part of our church uh, in a capacity of working, actually, would oftentimes be behind one of the cameras, capturing the worship service so that people around the world would be able to watch. And he is even now standing with us even today. And we give God praise. Come on, you can do better than that. You can do better than that. And man, as pastor and as your friend, I can't begin to express to you how I rejoice with you. Man, I'm excited about the decision you've made even on today. And even right now, the angels in heaven rejoicing. Man, I recall some of the conversations that we would have just in passing and how you would even talk about one occasion a friend that you was taking the message that I was sharing with them to encourage them. And to see now that you're here, man, it just really warms my heart. And I say that with all sincerity. I'm rejoicing with you, man. Our decision council, Deacon Mays, is going to guide you and walk with you. Come on, give him another wonderful hand. Wow. EBC, listen, let me again thank you uh, for something that we couldn't control. And you was able to make an adaptive move. Let me see the hands of those from EBC Atlanta. I see some <laughs> Look at that, EBC Atlanta. Appreciate you. Y'all press your way. EBC Douglasville, thank you for making space for us. And can we give a shout out to the EBC choir? Did an outstanding job. Lord Jesus. Y'all done put some pressure on EBC Atlanta. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we got to go step it up over there. Step it up over there. Job well done. And so proud of you all. Just continue to do what God has called you to do. And we're excited. EBC again, come next Sunday. We're going to take our time and work through the mission statement as I shared at the other locations. You know, oftentimes in leadership, we get on the HOV lane of leadership and we try to rush to get an organization and an institution to a certain destination. But oftentimes it's important to just get off the HOV lane and just take the scenic route and take your time and just enjoy the scenery. And so we're in that mode of leadership. We're taking the scenic route as we're going to take our time and work through our mission statement. Last but not least, I can't say it enough to the leadership team, the staff. Appreciate you all for making it happen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he bless your down sitting and your uprising. Be blessed, my brother. Be blessed, my sister. In Jesus' name, be blessed. As we go out doing what? On the count of three, our mission statement. We're going to do what this week? Go out and do.